title of the presentation as written here, Why Low Temperature Stirling Engines, Theory and Possibilities. Uh, to point it out at the beginning, theory is a big word, uh, because uh, if I uh, should go really in the theory, it would be boring for most of you. It's a lot of thermodynamic theory. And uh, the good thing about it is that uh, normally uh, you would say, it's too much science, I don't understand it, must be uh, studied people like uh, physicists like me who can do such things and the real world is completely different. Because I tell you, the sto uh, I start with the uh, invention of the Stirling engine in 1812. It was an age when uh, the first thermodynamic engine had been developed uh, just before, it was a steam engine, hmm? which then started, as we said, the industrial age. And uh, the first steam engines were used widely in Scotland and in England uh, to drive water pumps and to pump out the water of the mines, the coal mines. Hmm? And uh, working in the coal mines were mainly children, and because the steam vessels uh, under pressure for the steam engine, provisioning the steam engine to, to run, were built out of wood with steel rings. There were a lot of explosions happening and a lot of children killed. So Reverend Sterling was a reverend. He had a brother, he was an engineer. They said we should invent an engine which is not running with a dangerous steam. Um, so couldn't we build an engine running with air? But in principle, it's the same system. Uh, closed container, but no water becoming steam, just air inside, which is heated from the outside and start expanding, expanding and creating war. So they built it, and at this time, no thermodynamic theory was known. Not at all. Of course, you knew if you, this was already in the, the first engines running with air, were not built by Stirling. They were built 2,000, 2,500 years ago in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, and you had some. Um, uh, priest shamans uh, who didn't uh, say what they did but they had big temple doors tons of weight and they opened to say we are the shamans but because they know, knew that there was an air uh, container behind and they heated it with fire <laughs> so they said we are doing wonders and I will go a little bit more trying to describe the principles uh, which are involved in a Stirling engine uh, without using more than... I will use only one formula. And this formula uh, will then is the theoretical possible efficiency uh, of air or a gas being heated at one moment at a higher temperature, so building up a pressure, as you all know. If you have a vessel closed, filled with air, you heat it, you must take care. So after a certain while, boom, it will explode. Huh? And then, uh, if you have a vessel filled with air and you cool it, after a certain while, you will see sucking in, and pressure becomes low. So, um, heating a gas, brings high pressure, high pressure uh, gives power. Uh, if uh, you replace in the picture I just gave uh, in the pot, uh, if you replace the top by a movable top, sort of a piston, if you heat the gas, it will come out and will create power to the outside. And if you cool it, it will retract and come uh, pull it back. So, if you are heating and cooling in a changing in an interval, you will have a pressure 
fluctuation, higher pressure, lower pressure, higher pressure, which is working to the outside world. But this uh, will be explained much more precise. The terminus for efficiency. Efficiency means how many percent of the heat introduced in the gas is transformed in mechanical energy, which then I can change into electricity, into cooling, into mechanical energy. So it is oops, described by the temperature on the high side in Kelvin. Have I explained this short? Minus temperature on the low temperature side divided by the temperature on the high temperature side. And uh, why in Kelvin? I must explain. If you look to uh, temperatures, we have uh, in centigrade, zero degrees centigrade, and then we have temperatures rising, which can rise to infinity. It can, you can have a temperature of the sun is 5,700 degrees, uh, can, but you can have other stars with temperatures of millions of degrees, and uh, there's nobody is forbidding that in a fusion reaction when uh, stellar systems are, uh, are colliding, you get temperatures nearly endless. So you would think that on the minus scala should be the same, but it's not true. The absolute zero is minus 270 degree centigrade. Then you cannot cool further down. To explain this, uh, you can only give a picture. You know, if you are if you are vulgarizing uh, science, which normally is written in uh, equations, you are always simplifying. But also, if you are writing down the equations and you believe you understand completely the nature, is not true. There's some, always something underlying deeper. So I'm not telling you that I explain you exactly how it functions, but giving you just a little bit indication. Uh, what is temperature? Hmm? Uh, let's take a little, could be cylindrical container of gas, air, and we introduce, I symbolize it with a flame through the wall, we heat the wall, and then we heat the inner, and what happens is that suddenly these gas molecules are moving faster in all directions. So heat is changed to kinetic energy. That's evidently what is also causing pressure. If you consider these little molecules as particles, like ping pong balls, it makes a difference if this ping pong ball is uh, played softly or with a high power. So this impulse coming on the wall, on the wall is uh, uh, the energy we can extract. Now, if we cool it down, see, if we heat it, the vector, vector means uh, the speed, uh, impulse in one direction going to all directions, statistically becomes shrink, shrink, shrink. And so, until the moment, the molecule is no longer moving. And this is the absolute zero. That's minus 273 degrees. So, this was a Frenchman, Sadi Carnot, who uh, about uh, 60 years after, uh, Sterling built by intuition, I will come to that, a nearly ideal engine, he described uh, the formula. And now I ask, <coughs> Um, Daniel, to calculate if we would have a temperature on the high side of 100 degree centigrade, hmm, which is in Kelvin, 
373 Kelvin. And if we would have on the cool side, the temperature, typical temperature we have in a well in the water, hmm? because this is our cooling side, 20 degrees centigrade. So, and I will meanwhile produce a little scala, which is the efficiency over the temperature difference we apply to the gas. 21. Yeah, you see. It means, uh, and I will point out the importance of this. If we have a, a delta T, delta T means simply the difference between the high temperatures and low temperature. We just calculated for 80 Kelvin. Eh? So if you are at 80 Kelvin, which is a feasible, uh, pragmatically feasible, everybody uh, working a little bit in solar energy knows that it's extremely simple to reach with simple solar collectors as we show it here, 100 degrees centigrade at a good efficiency. And everybody knows that's a given fact that the well has a temperature of 20 degrees. So there, between these temperature differences, we just said 21%. Eh? So maximum, nobody can go over 100% according to the classical laws of physics. There are many people speaking about free energy and others, which is something completely different. But we stand here on grounds which we are completely sure. So we are at 0.21. And please now calculate, uh, if we are in a solar system, we speak about solar energy, uh, calculate the efficiency for the highest possible temperature we can reach with the sun. That is the surface temperature of the sun. It is 5,000. Is in Kelvin or in? I think it's 500,700 Kelvin already, and calculate it again against 20. So if someone has... A How? Hmm? You think you could get the, the full temperature? Yeah, in principle that's just be, uh, as long as he calculates. If you have a mirror, hmm? a very mm. precise mirror, an astronomical mirror, mm. and uh, you are concentrating the sun to a very small spot, then the highest possible temperature is just the surface temperature of the radiator, and this is the sun. So, of course, we don't reach it, but uh, had been reached in uh, real technology over 3,000 degrees centigrade. So, yeah, very high temperatures. What do we have? 95. Huh? 95. Yeah, look, if now we go to the solar temperature, we are here, that means, hmm. take another color, 95, nearly 100, something like this is a function. Hmm? The first thing to see, of course, everybody would like to have 95%. Huh? You have pure light and you transform it in an engine to practically 100% all photons transformed in energy. That's a physical possibility. But now we speak about pragmatic uh, realizations. First of all, if we are going, uh, if we should have an engine which works uh, at 5,700 degree Kelvin, uh, so first of all, we don't have the materials. It melts down. And secondly, yeah, oh, because we don't have the materials, we can't build it. There's many, many other reasons. Uh, it is more complicated uh, uh, than the most complicated technology we have today. So the tendency is to say, okay, 5,700, we cannot do, but please could you calculate one other thousand degrees centigrade? But maybe we could go at 1,000, delta T, hmm. <laughs> 
thousand will not be too bad. Huh? 77. It's not too bad. Huh? We are already 77 percent. Now pointing out. Thousand is feasible. And we have built engines with thousand degrees. And uh, of course then you need uh, austenitic steels to hold it, very special uh, alloys. And you can no longer work with air as a gas. You need helium or hydrogen and you are running into a lot of problems uh, of the tightness through the wall diffusion. It runs, it's fascinating, but would never be an engine, I would say. We go to Benin, <laughs> and we, even not to Germany, you know, if we have not the sun, maybe we could build it. Very expensive. Huh? So we see, at low temperature, easily feasible, potential already 20%. Now I want to put this into a relation. What does it mean? Is someone of you knowing what's the efficiency if you have a car? Hmm? You have a car and inside of the car you have temperatures of thousand degrees when you explode your fuel. Hmm? So if uh, the car engine would be built according to the thermodynamic limit law, you should have an efficiency of 70%, 77. Do you know how much an auto motor has as efficiency? Meaning? 20. 5%. Huh? 20. 20. 20, correct. It's around 20. So we realize that the potential of a Stirling engine, the potential, we are coming then, what can we really do? Huh? Already at a temperature, very soft temperature of 100 degrees, reaches uh, the efficiency of engines which have been developed over 100 years with an input of billions of billions of billions uh, to bring them to the stage they are. So that's interesting. And so that was the base. When we were working uh, and developing the high temperature systems, we said, okay, it's fascinating. It took us, we, we got over 10 years of our life in high temperature engines. And we also started thinking, how can we avoid uh, the, uh, the difficulties associated with very high concentrated solar energy and there's a complete other thing. We built windows out of quartz and we got directly with the radiation into the gas to be heated. And since the gas is transparent, it's not heating nice. So we had to produce some type of a, of a black gas. All this works, but after a certain while you have corrosion and all these things. So, one of the reasons we want to come very near to the 21% is that this is something which can really, uh, someone said it's a game changer. It's really a game changer. If we can uh, use um, solar heat in simple way to produce something in this range of efficiency, it will be a game changer. Now, what is today the perspective uh, of reaching, we are speaking of the sun, with the solar energy efficiencies around 21%. It's evidently the photovoltaic cells. At the moment, uh, the photovoltaic cells in market, uh, in average, you have to look this over year. If you look at the prospectus, they say, hey, we have a wonderful solar cell. It is, has 18% of efficiency. Hmm? But in the average, we will be in the 15%, which is okay. If we have, uh, if you look to a semiconductor, very nice, a plate uh, changing with 15% of the incident energy, uh, the photon energy into electricity, 
It means you have 150, if you have one, one kilowatt per square meter coming down, you have 150 watts per square meter electric peak. What happens with the rest? Hmm? It is? Yeah, but it's nothing is disappearing in nature. It's hitting and if 15% are electricity, what, uh, what are the other photons doing? Heat it. Mm -hmm. That's true. And reflection probably. Yeah, but this is, uh, uh, this is counted already in this efficiency. You know, one part is reflected, we count only what's coming in. So it's heat, simply it's heat. If you once observe a, a large photovoltaic field, what you see is that hot air is lifting over it. Huh? And why I'm telling you this, because I want to make a strong point of a Stirling engine. Uh, if you put, cover a full house with photovoltaic panels, you will have a lot of electricity, but you will have much more hot air. And this hot air is just disappearing uh, in the sky. If you have a Stirling engine, which is in the range of a photovoltaic module operating at this efficiency, it's different because, and I, as I said, you, Olivier, will go in more detail of a Stirling, but I schematically show you again container filled with air, in our case, and the top of it is suspended in a sort of a membrane, so it can move up and down. And we have an inbuilt and heat exchanger through which it's a solar collector, solar radiation is creating heat. This heat is going through in the heat exchanger is exchanging the heat uh, to the gas, so that's heated. And then we have on the other side, as we said, a heat exchanger which brings cooling typically from a well on the water. Uh, so we have here the high temperature, we have the low temperature. And inside we have sort of a piston which is going once in this position, once in this extreme position. Why? Because when it is in this position, all the air is at the hot side of a, we have the highest pressure. When it is in this position, all the air is exposed to the cold. Huh? So instead of uh, bringing at one moment heat in and then cooling it from outside, we have installed permanently a cool, cold, loop, cold loop and a hot loop and the displacer is shifting from hot to cold, and this simply means that uh, if we look on a pressure time scale, the moment we're moving up here, the pressure is rising in the system because we heat the air, and the moment we are going back, pressure goes down and so on. We have a, because it looks like this in the real system because we have a rotational system with flywheel and so on. And there are many other elements inside, like regenerators I don't describe now. 
But yes, it's a displacer brings the air uh, once on the in, to the cold side. All the air is faced to the heat exchanger, which is cold, and in the other position, all the air is exposed to the hot side. You know, at the, be the beginning, you would think you have a cylinder, yes. and simple, simple picture, you have a burner, biogas burner, for example, and you heat the cylinder from outside. Then, your, the pressure raises and your piston comes out, and over a flywheel system, you change this into rotation. And now you must, you have to go back, back, and if you don't have this configuration, now you need to cool from the outside the cylinder. Huh? If you have built in uh, permanently the heating and the cooling, then you only must displace the gas from one side to the other to create these pressure fluctuations. And, uh, okay, <laughs> why did I describe this? Because when we now said that the efficiency of such a system can be around 15%, 21% was the theoretical possible, then we are in the range of photovoltaics, but we are uh, on the cool side, we can control the temperature of the cool side. We can go uh, with this temperature higher than uh, uh, the uh, temperature of the well, for example, to 40 degrees, because it's all the water we need for showering and for domestic use. Of course, in this moment, the efficiency will shrink to 13%, something like this, because we have uh, reduced the delta T. But now, we have instead, from if 100% of solar energy hit our collector. Uh, we have now 13% in electricity, but the rest, it, at 40 degree hot water, so of course we always have losses by insulation, but in this case, uh, the total, total, uh, efficiency, meaning exploiting uh, the incoming energy stream, is not 13%, it's, it's near 100%. That means an, an engine is not only producing mechanical power and via generator electricity, it's also producing the rejected heat. And this is a co-generation uh, between mechanical power and heat, so it's a big, big advantage. I didn't get it. The last thing where you came to 100%, this last step, I didn't get it. Yeah. And if, if you, are, have, you are speaking about the uh, sterling, you are not back in the photovoltaic. No, but so I take again the picture of the photovoltaic to explain it to you. Uh, in the case of the photovoltaics, 100%, uh, in both cases, 100% of solar energy hits our collector. Hmm? And in photovoltaics, only 15% are usable as electricity. The other is warm air, which is not used. In the case of the Stirling engine, we have approximately the same efficiency for a low temperature Stirling engine in electricity, but the heat is concentrated in the warm water coming out. So, and this warm water it is exactly the same amount of energy which was lifted out in the air. So in this case, the usable uh, energy is nearly 100%. Because you use the hot water for a shower. And of course. Yeah. And if you're going into, uh, it's clear. And now we have to go to very, uh, hmm? But if you use the hot water for shower, yeah. then this means that it will be a more uh, high temperature and the efficiency of the 30% will be lower. Yeah, that's, no, no, I got from, from 50 to 30% already. Of course, if you would shower at 80 degrees, which is not good for your health, 
<laughs> you will reduce it. No? This is such a mixture, uh, ju just giving you uh, the general difference between a thermodynamic conversion of um, energy uh, in a low temperature sterling, and again, low temperature is easy to achieve uh, uh, compared to a monoculture system creating only electricity. That's, that's what I wanted to express. So, this is one of the advantages. Now you could say yes, but if you look uh, to the large photovoltaic stations sitting in the country, in Germany you find huge of them, you go to Israel, in the um, desert you find huge megawatt and more stations, they cannot, there's nobody living there. Hmm? What should they do with the heat? Uh, they only need the electricity to put it in their grid, and the rest, okay, the rest is the rest, it's lost. But we are talking here about decentral, small, autonomous systems. And only there it makes sense. Huh? If I'm going in a big central power station, now go, coming back uh, in principle, uh, besides the photovoltaic, in our systems, in our modern systems, we have large coal power stations. We have gas turbines, huh? uh, and they produce also heat which could be used, but it's not economic to transport in, uh, the heat in pipes from large distances in towns. But if you have it on a small size and sitting on your house roof or in your village, then you will need this heat. And if you are not doing it, if you wouldn't produce it like this, then you need extra uh, equipment, extra solar collectors to produce all the heat you you, you need. And one should never forget, please. You get, uh, I want to just uh, a short comment. In Turkey, please. we are also uh, using in small scales this uh, cogeneration. Yeah. In uh, photovoltaics. Yeah. We are just uh, making a little bit addition of, you know, uh, wi uh, a chilling system. Yes. And using the heat yes. as a cogenerator. And yes. it's also good for the efficiency of the photovoltaics. Yeah. Absolutely good, as yeah. As you know, the efficiency decreases with, with the higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, we are using it in small scale, but I'm not sure whether it's manufactured. Yeah. It's, it's a very good point. And everybody should cool photovoltaic cells actively to win. Uh, these things. We worked a lot on this. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed what we call cool photon uh, filters in front of the PV panels to cool them. That's true. That's good. But so for Sterling, it's a given fact. We have a cogeneration fact. That's the one thing. And uh, this alone, combined with the simplicity of the engine, you will see is justifying uh, that we answer the question why low temperature sterling engines with a yes, yes we should have them because they are easy, they are simple, they use air, they don't need exotic gases, uh, the temperatures involved are absolutely easily controllable. But now comes the next point, a very important point. There is a question before you go to the Yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you do a sterling machine, you have to give out. We have 500 to 600 kg stahl, we have pipes, different things. Mm -hmm. How long must so a sterling machine last, so that you have the energy that you have to use to use the whole thing? Okay, I will translate it. You, you know, he, he, he raises a very important question, and this is a question in technical terms called, what is the grey energy? What is grey energy? The definition of grey energy of a system is the following: if you build a system, you need energy to build it. So, if you have, and uh, the question he is raising is completely correct and good. If you, if you need. Uh, hundreds of kilograms of steel, uh, you have to produce a steel, 
in a forgery with 1,000 degrees centigrade, it requires energy. Eh? And the piping and everything associated. So basically, the question is, how long must a system run to win back the energy which was put in to build it? Eh? That is the gray amortization. Eh? So far, um, it's clear. First of all, uh, again, thank you, it's a very good question. Uh, the less material we have in, the less weight, the faster it will be. And you, you point out, these are heavy, heavy babies, <laughs> so it will take time before they have their uh, amortization. Uh, we calculated this for the engines we have at the moment. This is roughly one year. We have it back. But hmm? how many hours working in one year? If we work 24 hours, and I'm coming just to the next point, can we work 24 hours, 365 days? Uh, but I wanted to mention another point. Uh, there is a development in all these systems. And the development means that the status we have reached. Uh, is for sure good to start going into applications, but we should not be uh, completely satisfied about it. So what we are at the moment developing as the next generation of uh, Sunpulse Sterling engines, you would not recognize it. It's nearly no material at all. <laughs> but that's future. So at the moment we are there, and now how can we reach that the engine runs 24 hours? That's a, another point. To repeat, application, decentral, small, using both qualities I described here, electricity and heat. Now, uh, we said small decentral systems, but we want that the systems become independent, autonomous. You can become only autonomous if you are 100% self-sufficient in energy. If not, if you say, okay, I am 70%, you will always depend from an outside energy input. So the interesting thing with solar energy is, especially if you go to countries like Mali, Africa, we have uh, so much more energy as ever we would need. But we have also nights in Mali, eh? and if we need uh, nighttime energy, uh, it comes, what we said, to the problem of interim storage of the solar heat to use it driving the engine day and night. And this is exactly the strongest point of a low temperature Stirling engine. Because uh, when you, what I mentioned, when you go to this very attractive 70% uh, potential at 1000 degrees, of course you can store heat at 1000 degrees, but it becomes very technical. You need, you need again, you can go with molten salts, not to 1000 degrees, up to 800 degrees, but then you have technological problems and so on. And if we are working at this temperature range, we simply apply, in the simplest case, hot water storage, which costs nearly nothing compared to the alternative, uh, which is the photovoltaic electric storage. Mm? So if you if we add to this system we go first from our collector we heat our storage well isolated tank dimensioned in the way that we are collecting during daytime the energy to run the engine daytime and nighttime so it will run 24 hours. And uh, we compared this uh, to the photovoltaic 
electric battery system. Again, I want to make a remark at the beginning, not to create the wrong impression. I, I already said it, if you have your computer, I don't say you put a little heat storage and a little Stirling engine. It would be completely stupid. You put a lithium-ion battery in this case, and because the computers don't use a lot of energy, it's one of the charms, eh? This is not energy production, this is information and the, uh, the, the transformation in the technical world of um, information um, dissipation in uh, PCs, semiconductors, electronic system is so that they need nearly no energy compared to your washing machine and to other things. So I am a big fan uh, of a very small high-tech electronic devices for communication running out of solar cells and of uh, little batteries. But if we want to translate this to a household, hmm? and uh, then uh, typical American households, we have seen this, there's Elon Musk, I think I mentioned Elon Musk, you know, everybody knows him? We spoke about him yesterday. Yeah, yeah, and everybody was here, so the Tesla man. He will be, in 2022, uh, he will deliver, that's a plan, uh, photovoltaic areas with uh, massive battery banks of lithium iron. And um, the costs per uh, kilowatt hour of electricity, of course, must be competitive uh, to the grid electricity and only if you you are competitive you will come into this market so he predicts coming in into the market in 2022 and uh, the costs uh, he predicts at the time 2022 of electricity is higher than today that's what can be observed and he says then we will have it so there's a lot of assumptions inside. First, he must build his really massive, huge, uh, one of the largest factories in the world in Arizona. They just start building. And uh, here comes again the questions of gray energy. Because in order to produce lithium iron batteries, you need huge amounts of energy. So he was ask the question also, but from where do you, if you want now to bring to a country like USA uh, the energy autonomy in the private homes through PV and batteries, what is your requirement of grey energy to produce it? So his answer was first looking fantastic and secondly was not right. Because he said, okay, look, I have, uh, don't know, 10 hectares of surface on my factory roof. I put photovoltaic cells on it, and the energy of the photovoltaic cells will produce the energy to build the lithium ion batteries. In principle, it's true, but only the uh, power he wins uh, from the surface of his roof is even not 1% of what he requires. So they will have to build a massive, massive, huge, largest uh, solar power station around. So going into these calculations for the simple case of sunny countries, and uh, I must remember that our impetus to develop these low temperature Stirling engines was sunny countries. It started in Mali huh? <laughs> when we studied the uh, villages and in the surrounding countries. And there, under these conditions, you have statistically next day the sun comes up, you will have uh, a maximum of three, four days of sandstorm sometimes. That's what we studied. So we should extend our storage to such periods. Hmm? And if we would come in a region in which it would be maybe one week or 14 days, then 
uh, we should combine it with biogas typically. That's what we have learned because biogas is a form of stored solar energy which is not losing like uh, the temperature is losing in a, in a sensible storage. And all these random conditions taken into account, uh, we calculated it through uh, for a 20 years lifetime cycle. That should be also always done if you run 20 year system. We are uh, compared to a photovoltaic battery system uh, with such a, you could say, nearly primitive, simple uh, solutions. Uh, economically, we are about four to five times better. And the second thing. Um, over the lifetime. Over the lifetime, yeah, because you have to rechange batteries, and in case of heat storage, you don't have to rechange. Then we have the other advantages I mentioned uh, that we don't need something exotic. We are not going uh, to, to make the next, to impose the next political pressure onto countries like Bolivia uh, having massive amounts of lithium. Huh? So the distribution, we are speaking, this here is a peace center and one of the major reasons of wars and struggle in the world is the fight for the energy reserves. Therefore, these are advantages. And the third one is, of course, uh, will be very difficult at the time being to install, for example, in Benin or in Mali or in Togo, uh, a factory uh, producing lithium-ion batteries. But will be very simple to use the existing infrastructure of welders, of people working with metals to build those components. So that is the reason, the main reason, we can become independent. Now, uh, let's look a little bit more uh, to the other possibilities associated to a low temperature Stirling engine. As you, as you have seen yesterday, we can, we can run the Stirling inversively. And then it's cooling. I think most of you could drink nice cold beer. We, we produced with it. And how does it function? It's, it feels really quick too. Hmm? It feels really quick too. Yeah, it's, it's efficient, very efficient. So, one last little theoretical pictures, so-called pressure volume diagram. It uh, gives you uh, this closed cycle, how such an engine works. Hmm? Uh, if we introduce heat in the gas, the pressure is rising. So we need a crank system which allows that the highest pressure is reached before it's delivering through our mechanism this energy in motion. So when we have reached this point, and Olivier will explain this, then we are using the cinetic energy of the molecules to expand. Volume becomes larger, pressure becomes lower until we have extracted uh, the possible energy in the frame of this Carnot theorem. Huh? Then when we have reached this, here we heating the gas, now we cool the gas, this side. And then we have to bring back the gas to the initial status. Therefore, we need a little bit energy, which is coming out of the flywheel, recompressing it to the primary stage. And uh, here in we have the energy of the system. And in the case of low temperature, we said we are in the range 15% we can reach. If, if now someone turns on the flywheel, I mean, reversing the cycle, 
the cycle runs this way. If we are running reversively by introducing mechanical energy to drive it, then we are creating temperature differences. Because we are not bringing in heat and cold. Now we are creating heat and cold. On the one side, it becomes cold. That's what we use uh, for our uh, cooling device here. And on the other side, we deliver heat. It's a heat pump. And the, uh, since we reach a good portion of this theoretical uh, efficiency thermodynamically, the same counts, counts for counts for the heat pump cooling cycle. A heat pump means the following. Everybody knows you put in your compressor <laughs> some mechanical energy and then you will have cooling. And you can have much more cooling energy than you put in mechanical energy. It's a heat pump effect. And uh, the real uh, stage we have uh, we have reached uh, today is that with a low temperature Stirling engine if we bring in one unit of mechanical energy to drive it we will have uh, about five units of cooling. That means if we bring in for example in the Sun Pulse 500 500 watts of photovoltaic energy, we will have 2.5 kilowatts of ice producing um, cooler. That's calculated for a temperature difference between ice around zero degree and the 25 degree water we start with. If you want to go much deeper, then uh, it will become less than the multiplication factor of five. If we want to cool only uh, to the temperature of cold beer, eight degrees, then it will be seven like this. The theoretical possible is nearly double of this. So we have reached about 50% of the theoretical possible, which is not super exciting, but which is not bad. <laughs> but it shows you, it shows you the potential. Um, in our next uh, engine development, we call it Pulsator, and I mentioned it, with very low masses, so gray energy will be one month maximum uh, before we amortize uh, the cost of production. We will reach not 50% of the Kano efficiency, but between 80 and 90% nearly the ideal, and then it becomes even more attractive. We produce mechanical energy, electrical energy. The mechanical energy coming out of an engine will be used directly for milling, uh, for tools, much more intelligent than putting electric motor between, which you would need if you produce only electricity. Heating, cooling extending the operation over 24 hours. If uh, coming into climatic conditions where the storage would become uneconomic for extreme situations, combine it with uh, the heat uh, which is available on place, which is storable. Biogas or in the simple, simplest case a wood stove. If you have wood stoves and you run wood stoves in a cold climate, a uh, lot of the energy is going out of the chimney, so you can use it here. And these are big advantages, because heat is available all over the places. Also think about existing structures with rejected heat from industrial processes. It's a huge potential. And I will end with this, uh, with a statement from the year 1900. I think it was 32 or 33. The German industry, not having uh, sterling, they would have used it, uh, but they, they, they built uh, little steam engines 
to use all their rejected heat. So the German industry was completely autonomous in production of electricity because they closed the loop. Then came the Nazis and said, no, we need a centralization of the electric energy because they started to build the war machine and they needed to control this. And after Second World War, uh, the law still existed that's forbidden to use <laughs> your rejected heat wow. until my dear friend Hermann Scheer, who <coughs> unfortunately passed away, very famous man, uh, had uh, the alternative reasonable price for solar energy. He, he pointed this out to the Bundestag. Uh, wow. So they became all right as an old Nazi <laughs> law. And from this time we started revenging. So all this speaks in favor of a low temperature engine. However, um, what means low? Low 100 degrees is a little bit cool for us. Uh, we can reach with vacuum collectors with wonderful efficiencies. The 200 degree stage with our fixed focus we can easily reach with nearly optical efficiency uh, 300 degrees. So of course the next things coming are can we then, that's something for the free lab, can we um, go in the range of 200 degrees, can we reach then 20 to 35 percent of mechanical efficiency in principle easily feasible if we replace our membranes uh, which are at the moment at the limit of something like 200 degrees to membranes of 300 degrees. Firemen in the world are producing new textile structures allowing them to go into fire of 500 degrees. So it's completely clear. Uh, at a given time we may be in the efficiency range between 20 and 30 percent with these engines, but 30 percent are already very good. Thank you very much. And, uh,